to introduce our speaker. Dr. Megan Caratori is an assistant professor in the Department of Breast Medical Oncology in the Division of Cancer Medicine at MD Anderson Cancer Center. She joined MD Anderson when she was awarded, awarded a clinical fellowship in 2011. Her research includes focus on geriatric oncology, and she has published several peer-reviewed articles on the subject. Welcome, Dr. Caratori. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Hey, thank you, Christine. So as mentioned, my name is Megan Carturi, and I'm a medical oncologist who specializes in breast cancer at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. My passion both in the clinic and in research is specifically the care of older breast cancer patients. Our webinar today will focus on relevant issues in breast cancer care as it pertains to older adults, highlighting areas where there is data on disparate practices and outcomes. The same factors that contribute to health disparities in general are associated with worse outcomes for people with cancer as well, and age has been acknowledged as one such factor. So for the objectives of our presentation today, we will, one, understand the epidemiology and facts regarding healthcare disparities in older adult breast cancer patients, two, recognize issues and outcomes related to screening in older women, three, learn about the effects of aging in general on patients with cancer, four, uh, learn how we evaluate our older patients with cancer in the clinic, and finally, understand the differences in treatment pertaining to older women, specifically, specifically looking at the setting of early stage disease. We will end our presentation today with a summary of the topics reviewed. For our first objective, we will start with basic facts about the incidence of breast cancer in older adults and some information on disparities. So breast cancer is clearly a disease associated with aging, and age is a major risk factor for breast cancer. 63 years old is the average age of diagnosis in the U.S. In other words, women age 65 and older constitute nearly half of the patients with breast cancer. Therefore, older patients are clearly the individuals we are caring for, and this will become more of an issue over time. Here are statistics of how the U.S. population is aging, but this is really true anywhere in the world. From 2010 to 2030, the largest growth of the population is in the 65 and 70 plus age groups. In 2011, the baby boomers actually started turning 65. So in 2030, the largest growth of breast cancer cases will be in the 80-year-old and over age group. So what does this mean in practical terms? From 2010 to 2030, as noted in the bottom graph, because of the association of cancer and aging and the rise in the aging population, there will be a significant increase in breast cancer cases, and this rise is driven specifically in patients over the age of 65, with an estimated 33% increase. We also know that aside from being common, breast cancer is often more fatal in older women. Of the annual 70,000 invasive cases in women aged 70 and older in the U.S. annually, the older subgroup makes up about 31% of the cases, and but 47% of all deaths. Here does, here's a distribution of stage at diagnosis for older women within a large national database. Early stage is usually defined as stage 0 to 2 disease, which occurs at a rate of about 80% in older patients, with the remainder of cases presenting as more advanced stage disease. We know that the stage of breast cancer matters with regard to survival and thinking how breast cancer may affect someone's longevity. In this same study, patients with stage 3 and 4 disease were most likely to die of their breast cancer, more than 70%, whereas those with early stage disease most commonly die of cardiovascular disease and only 2% of them their breast cancer. And, the, and certainly the more advanced stage patients are indicated by these two lines on the bottom. If we look at tumor distribution by histology and subtype by age, the distributions are relatively similar, similar across different age groups. However, older women with estrogen receptor positive breast cancers are far more prevalent, with more than 86% of patients having this type of disease. In breast cancer, we know that patients with estrogen receptor positive disease, also known as ER positive or hormone receptor positive breast cancer, generally have more favorable outcomes with more curable disease and a better prognosis. 
However, despite showing the more favorable prognosis cancers that older women tend to have, we know that breast cancer specific outcomes for older women are suboptimal and we know that this tends to occur at the extremes of aging in both the older and younger subgroups where breast cancer specific survival is the worst. This is represented by the two lines um, at, um, in the red and black indicating the older age subgroup. We would ar oh, argue that, um, and why are the outcomes worse? Um, the reasons are multifactorial, and we would argue a lot is related to undertreatment, which would, could come in various forms. One is the emission of treatment, where radiation, hormonal therapy, chemotherapy, and treatments like Herceptin are simply not given to patients. This is sometimes appropriate, but in most cases, omission of treatment is often inappropriate and done too commonly. Also, we know that older patients are less likely to complete treatment, have lower rates of adherence to oral therapies, have higher rates of low in lower intensity treatment, have more toxicity to treatment, and receive more non-guideline non based treatment. There are also other factors playing a role, such as variable biology and potentially overtreatment, which makes this very complicated because overtreatment as well can result in worse treatment related outcomes. So with the growing number of older patients with breast cancer and the observation that they have worse outcomes, this really forces us as oncologists to ask the question as to how we can optimally treat patients so we can maximize survival while accounting for important factors like overall life expectancy, comorbid illnesses, and toxicity of treatment. In other words, how can we optimally treat our older patients so that we maximize outcomes without placing them at added risk? So before develop, delving into the issues related to treatment, I wanted to take this opportunity to discuss some issues and outcomes related to breast cancer screening in older women. So we'll start by reviewing the brief history of mammography. Medicare began covering for biennial mammograms first in 1991. After nearly a decade and a great number of large clinical studies, Medicare began covering annual mammograms in 1998. Finally, the present guidelines for screening women 40 and older every one to two years emerged in 2002. What we want to emphasize, however, is that there is a considerable uncertainty about the benefit of screening mammography in women aged 75 years and older, while large studies in women aged 50 to 74 indicate that screening mammography is associated with a reduction in breast cancer mortality of 15 to 35 percent after 10 to 15 years. None of these trials included women over the age of 74. However, an increasing number of studies in the past couple years have began looking at mammography in older adults, specifically at trends and outcomes. This one in particular looked at a large data set showing that only 51% of women 80 and older were screened at least every two years. By life expectancy, 62% of those with an estimated life expectancy of 10 or more years were screened, 53% with a life expectancy of 5 to 10 years, and 39% with a life expectancy of less than five years. This next study shows something slightly differently, uh, slight different, slightly different, highlighting that uh, there are potential burdens of mammograms among women age 80 years and older. The investigators conducted a cohort study of 2011 women without a history of breast cancer who were aged 80 and over between 1994 and 2004. The majority of women 80 and older were screened with mammography, um, yet few benefited. Meanwhile, 12.5% of patients experienced burden from um, uh, screening with some false positive mammograms and some biopsies that resulted in benign findings. Therefore, the current guidelines support what is known as choosing wise, wisely strategy in older women. And what this strategy informs us is that for women with less than a 5 to 10 year life expectancy, recommendations to stop screening should be framed around increased harms and the need to refocus health promotion on interventions likely to be beneficial over a shorter time frame. For women with a life expectancy of 5 to 10 years, the decision about whether potential benefits of screening outweighs harms is a value-based judgment that requires a realistic understanding of screening outcomes. Looking at this more in a graphical form, we encourage that women and their providers make personalized breast cancer screening decisions after factoring in their estimated life expectancy, overall risk of them actually having, their, having a cancer in terms of recurrence or death, and individual patient preferences and values. 
So our next learning objective is to touch on the effects of aging as it pertains to patients with cancer, acknowledging that there are interactions with treatments that could place patients at a higher risk for complications and toxicities. So generally speaking, we know that the degree of comorbidity, defined as the presence of other serious illnesses, increases with aging. There is also a decline in organ reserves, such as liver, kid kidney, or cognitive functioning with aging as well. Furthermore, the way our body processes drugs changes with aging, leading to less rapid clearance of drugs, subsequently making us more vulnerable to side effects. In fact, if we look at an average 75-year-old patient compared to an adult age 30, we know that they have about 92% of brain weight, 84% of the basic metabolic rate, 70% of the kidney function rate, and 43% of the lung capacity of the younger, of their younger, um, of younger patients. That being said, we know that age is not just defined by a number and that the status of our health is defined by so much more. In other words, although all older patients experience an age-associated decrease in physiologic reserve, marked differences in the rates of decline are observed amongst different individuals. This is why our next objective is such an important discussion point, and that is learning how, as healthcare providers, we are able to evaluate our older patients with cancer to determine what their actual physiologic age is and what treatment approach is the best for them. So the key questions we as providers have to ask ourselves and discuss with our patients is first, do we need to actually treat the cancer? In some cases, this may be a no if our patients have another disease or ailment that is more life-threatening. Second, if we do treat, which of our patients is vulnerable to toxicity? Are there things we can do to determine side effects and predict for them? Finally, are there modifications we can make to therapy based on a patient's health state? For instance, if they have some functional deficits, some cognitive issues, issues with memory, signs of cognitive dysfunction. And in some cases, if they have um, issues with their social situation, poor social support, living independently with transportation issues. In older patients in particular, we know that an important consideration is patient preference. And this is an interesting study in which they surveyed older patients and asked them, if they had a life-threatening illness, would they rather die from their condition or take treatment that caused short or long-term functional or cognitive impairment? Interestingly, a majority were not willing to pursue treatment that would jeopardize their ability to live and function independently or cause issues with their memory and thinking, which shows that quality of life is very important in this age demographic. Ideally, performing a good assessment will al would allow us to assign patients to different categories and treat them accordingly. For instance, in an older adult who we deem to be very fit, we would be comfortable with pursuing our best standard of care treatment as opposed to patients that were frail where we would pursue only measures that would, that would provide them with some comfort. Of course, there's a group that falls in the middle where treatment decisions may be slightly more difficult to make, and we need good assessment measures to help guide us along the right treatment course in this po patient population deemed to be at high risk. So there are various assessment tools to provide a way to estimate the functional reserve of a patient, identify areas where interventions may be instituted, and predict their survival. Geriatricians use the term comprehensive geriatric assessment, also known as the CGA, to, de to describe a multidisciplinary evaluation of a range of different domains that have been found to predict survival in older individuals in general. These domains I have listed on the left and include functional status, which describes activities that they are able to do on a daily basis, comorbidity, cognition, nutritional status, psychological status, and psychological status includes issues like coexisting depression or anxiety, the degree of social support, and how many different medications a patient takes. Several short screening tests make up the geriatric assessment that evaluate each of these specific parameters. In fact, national guidelines of both the National Comprehensive Cancer Network and the International Society of Geriatric Oncology recommend that we routinely use the comprehensive geriatric assessment in patients over the age of 65. The table on the right again lists all the important elements of the geriatric assessment and the associated screening test undertaken for each element. We will look at an example of one of these tests in, in some of our upcoming slides. In cancer patients, the use of the CGA has been found to be very revealing. It has been found to predict complications and side effects of treatment, 
estimate survival of older patients, assist providers in making um, decision treatment recommendations, assist patients in making treatment decisions, and uncover the presence of what is known as geriatric syndromes. And examples of geriatric syndromes include things like falls, incontinence, delirium. We will look at one of the many screening tests um, in the geriatric assessment, which helps us in assessing a patient's functional status. Um, so we wanted to introduce you to what is known as activities of daily living as, as one of the assessments undertaken to determine someone's functional status. And we survey our patients on um, their ability to perform these various activities like dressing, bathing, toileting, transfers, continence, and eating. Studies have shown us that patients that require assistance in their activities of daily living are at greatest risk for a prolonged hospital stay, worsening of function in the hospital. These patients are ones that are more likely to, likely to utilize home care or require nursing home placement and are at greater risk even for death. In fact, assistance with one or more activities of daily living has been found to be an associated, um, has been found to be associated with an average life expectancy of less than three years in some studies. Another element of the geriatric assessment are instrumental activities of daily living, which are higher functioning activities that allow patients to maintain their independence in the community. They include tasks listed on the left, like shopping, housekeeping, transportation, laundry, ability to use the telephone, management of finances, and taking medication on one's own. In one particular study shown on the right in cancer patients, um, they found that patients with a better score on their IADLs, or independent activities of daily living, had a better prognosis. And this was even a better prognosis as compared to those that had deficits in their activities of daily living or higher comorbidity. comorbidity. So our next and final objective is to specifically look at treatment of breast cancer in older adults and how this may differ from a younger patient population. In particular, well, we will focus on early stage disease where perhaps there is more real world and trial based data and evidence in older adults to help guide us along. So generally speaking, we know that older adults are not always managed according to guidelines. Surprisingly, we know that studies support both the over and under treatment of older adults. We discussed this at the beginning of the presentation, but we know that there are examples of older women having worse outcomes from breast cancer on account of receiving less aggressive treatment for early stage disease, and they have a higher mortality rate as a result. What is reassuring is that we know that older adults, 65 and up, derive similar benefits from treatment as compared to younger adults albeit with, a, with the concern that they are also at increased risk of side effects and treatment-related deaths. This again affirms why it is so important to pick our patients and treatments carefully. So piecing it all together, in the older patient, we must place breast cancer treatment in the context of life expectancy, preferences, comorbidity, and toxicity. The main reason we have no great guidelines for treatment in older adults is that we are stuck extrapolating data from studies that primarily enrolled younger patients. A review of large studies, including some 6 to 7,000 women with early stage breast cancer, found that only 8% were aged 60 years and older, and only 2% 70 and older. This graph shown here does a nice job at looking at accrual of older patients across several different cancer uh, types to clinical trials over time, which truly is a challenge for our nation. So we can see that there is a segment of, of accrual in older patients in the yellow and blue lines across the years from 2001 to 2011 as compared to patients less than 65. And the older, older patients are indicated by the blue and yellow, yellow representing patients 65 74 in the blue patients older than 75. Breast cancer itself, um, so that was all cancer types, but breast cancer itself is no different. And several large studies have looked at accrual of over age in several settings, from curable to metastatic disease, illustrating the lower accrual of older adults over time shown in the yellow line. So you can see that difference. And this is looking at age greater than 65 and age greater than 70. Turning our attention back to treatment of early stage breast cancer, specifically in older adults, in select cases, cases, omission of surgery may be actually appropriate. This is mostly in patients with hormone receptor positive tumors or more indolent, slower growing 
favorable type of breast cancer, who either decline surgery or are not candidates for surgical therapy given their medical comorbidities and or short predictive life expectancies. Studies have shown that in these cases, utilizing antiestrogen therapy, oral medicines, can control disease in the majority of patients for about two years. Another aspect of surgical therapy is the omission of sampling of the lymph nodes, known as sentinel node surgery, in select cases where patients have no lymph nodes that are visualized on their initial breast imaging. In terms of radiation after surgery, particularly what is known as breast-conserving surgery or lumpectomy, there is established research in older patients as well. So studies have shown us that in older women with hormone receptor positive, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer that have no evident lymph nodes and their tumors are less than or three centimeters, if they are willing to receive endocrine therapy, radiation can be safely omitted without any significant adverse effects on their outcomes. And these are just a large pivotal trial showing that this was a very the very feasible approach in our older patients with specified disease. Adjuvant chemotherapy um, is another area that's um, certainly been looked at in older adults. It's used in the setting of early stage disease to reduce the risk of recurrence of breast cancer. Studies have shown us that older women derive the same degree of benefit in regard to reduction of disease recurrence and improvement in mortality as compared to younger women. Additionally, the same treatments are beneficial so they've done studies trying to de-escalate the types of chemotherapy in older women, hoping that the toxicity wouldn't side effects would be less. But unfortunately, these studies have shown that these treatments simply aren't as beneficial and that more state-of-the-art advanced treatments are, are the right way to go. The caveat, as we discussed before, however, is that toxicity is a concern. The graph in the blue and yellow on the left notes that hospitalization rates are higher in older patients as compared to younger patients for many different treatment regimens used in early stage disease. And this is essentially the blue and the yellow lines compared, um, compared side by side. We also note that older patients are at high risk for death due to chemotherapy, cardiac to toxicity with certain agents, and also at an increased risk of developing secondary cancers associated associated with various chemotherapy agents. So switching our focus now to adjuvant endocrine therapy, this has also been looked at in older adults. It's used in the setting of early stage estrogen-driven breast cancer to decrease the risk of recurrence of breast cancer that can happen even five to 10 years from the original diagnosis. The benefits of adjuvant endocrine therapy in older patients are real. So hormonal therapy in older patients has been shown to prevent recurrence with regard to ipsilateral breast cancer on the same side, contralateral breast cancer on the opposite side, or systemic, so breast cancer showing up in different parts of the body, and lowers mortality rate, except possibly in patients who have very, very low risk cancers. This may not be the case. Aromatase inhibitors in particular are drugs that can increase the risk of bone disorders but are used in early stage breast cancer and bone disorders that are, that are commonly implicated in the setting include osteopenia and osteoporosis and we know that patients that have these are at significant increase for bone fractures. Multiple studies have demonstrated that patients on certain types of endocrine therapy known as aromatase inhibitors as compared to tamoxifen are at higher risk of having a fracture for, for, which, for which rates are quoted as being around 0.9 to 11%, placing them at a, a 1.5 times increased risk as compared to tamoxifen, which doesn't have that risk. This certainly may be more impactful in older women to know this, um, where bone dis health disorders are more commonly found. So what therapy is ideal to use as endocrine therapy in older adults? We know that this is the answer to this is what are they more likely to take? So adherence is a major problem in older women, and we know that poor adherence leads to inferior outcomes. This study shows that patients that discontinue therapy early, as depicted by the red line, have inferior outcomes as compared to patients who stick to the total recommended duration of therapy, which is five years. Poor adherence has been looked at in multiple studies. This particular study shows that as compared to younger patients, those age 70 and older, um, the bars on the left, are at higher risk for discontinuing treatment. To summarize findings regarding endocrine therapy for early stage breast cancer, 
we know that almost all older patients with hormone receptor positive, ER positive breast cancer will benefit from hormonal therapy, and they benefit as much as younger women. We know that in these women, five years of therapy is often adequate. We know that adherence is very important. We have to work with patients to optimize this adherence, which means addressing side effects appropriately. Another issue to consider with adherence is drug costs, and this may be a barrier for some patients. Ideally, as, on as oncologists, we should also work with primary care providers who are also following breast cancer patients while they are on these therapies to optimize adherence and address side effects. In conclusion, we have shown today that there are issues of both undertreatment and overtreatment in the care of older adults with breast cancer. Undertreatment, of course, can lead to inferior outcomes. However, overtreatment is an issue as well, as patients may have more to lose and less to gain from therapies. In some cases, these therapies would include surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy. There also may have competing, there also may be competing causes of comorbidity that may be more cr a critical consideration at the time. Treatment consideration should be based upon the general threat and prognosis of a patient's particular breast cancer and take into account their global health status, including issues like life expectancy, in addition to their preferences. However, we should not make treatment recommendation, recommendations based simply upon their chronological age alone. As healthcare providers, we need to do our part in assessing our older patients so that we can help them and their families to understand the benefits of treatment and quantify the risks of treatment. As we discussed, a geriatric assessment can be a very helpful tool in helping us figure this out. Furthermore, it is important that we work together with patients and their families to make the best personalized decisions possible. And this final slide shows all the factors that interact in making these challenging decisions. While there is no one right answer, we know that through an integrated, multidisciplinary approach engaging not only patients, but primary care providers, geriatricians, social workers, advocates, and of course family members, we can help make the best decisions with our patients that lead to the best possible outcomes. Thank you, and I think that's, that's the presentation for today. Thank you so much. So I want to um, encourage the audience to submit questions now in the question panel on your screen. Uh, we do have a couple of questions to get started with. So the first question, uh, does the incidence of recurrence change as people age, and is that especially true for certain subtypes? That's a great question. So. You know, certainly in terms of recurrence, um, we know that it's, it's, a, it's similar across the board. And I think where it becomes really relevant is are we, you know, where patients might be at greater risk, and we showed some of that data, is, is because they're not necessarily receiving, you know, the best, end, like at in, this, in the setting of endocrine receptor positive or, breast, or hormone receptor positive just disease, endocrine agents, or in certain settings, chemotherapy or radiation, it's more the, what are we doing in terms of interventions that are maybe leading to, um, you know, not as favorable outcomes. But in terms of patterns of recurrence and, and the actual biology, we think it's very similar across the ages. Thank you. You talked a little bit about working with a patient's primary care physician. Can you talk a little bit more about how you would recommend coordinating care for those with other health issues as well? Right. No, that's a great question. So, you know, we know that our ASCO and ASCO, and I, I, I referenced a couple of these, um, you know, these national guidelines and these agencies that basically put out and publish and endorse these guidelines. ASCO is one of the, the largest ones we as oncologists get a lot of our treatment recommendations to, and they're big. There are big groups and um, consensus bodies that publish these guidelines. So ASCO has certain guidelines that stands for the American Society of Clinical Oncologists on how we should follow patients. And typically in, in the setting of survivorship, so when our cancer patients are breast cancer free but may have received certain therapies um, such as surgery, radiation, chemotherapy in some cases and we'll follow, we're following them long term, we're seeing them, you know, every three to four months for maybe the first two years and spacing out our visits after that every six months. So really, I mean, we know that in these, in these time periods in between, um, when our patients are seeing us, they are seeing their primary care providers and things are going on in their lives. They're 
um, they're getting diagnosed with diabetes or um, have other issues that are, um, you know, developing. Um, and I think that uh, it's important to know that as our breast cancer patients are surviving, there's other things going on that we may not know about and that could be interacting with um, their breast cancer treatments. For instance, you know, if if they're on um, one of these endocrine agents and, and there's issues that are going on with, you know, the development of heart disease or um, worsening of osteoporosis. And, and these are these are things that could affect their ability to take the adjuvant endocrine therapy. So I think it's just important and, and it's challenging to do because we do have these limited, um, you know, limited time times in our, you know, in terms of actual appointments and how how long we're able to sit down and really go into everything. But I think just keeping that line of communication open, um, taking an opportunity to at least discuss at some point um, with the patient's primary care provider what, um, where they are in the cancer treatment. Um, there's, there's a big push for us to provide patients with treatment plans where they just very clearly have outlined for them exactly all that went into their cancer treatment and they are encouraged to share these with their primary care providers. So a lot of it is, you know, I think it's, it's, it's the responsibility of the physician that certainly in part um, relies on the patient being very well informed and very, very feeling very comfortable to convey that information to their primary care providers because they may be less familiar um, with the cancer treatments and the cancer journey. So I think it's just this open line of communication that needs to be um, needs to be maintained and um, you know educating our patients exactly on what what they can expect and things that they should maybe come to their oncologist about versus go to their you know, primary care doctor about or um, you know, just really, I think it, it really does come down to education and, and familiarity with um, side effects and, um, you know, issues that may develop down the line. So someone has a question about managing side effects. And the question is, can you talk about treatments to help with the side effects of AIs and how to get Medicare to cover them, such as acupuncture? Um, yeah. Maybe we can talk a little bit about palliative care and mm -hmm. also the joint and bone pain, which you touched upon during the presentation. Sure, sure. So I think that's um, that's always a struggle for us. Um, we do know that, um, and, and this this um, person has mentioned acupuncture, so we do know that it has been um, there has been some suggestion that it helps with symptoms like hot flashes or for some patients, joint aches and pains, and this hasn't really panned out to, you know, we don't have great data, like objective data to support this, but, you know, anecdotally, we do have, um, we all have that experience, and it is it is a struggle. And um, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not sure what undertakings are being done, on, like what is being done on a larger scale to help, um, help with some of these issues. Um, I think it does help, you know, for us to document as providers as often as we can that we're referring a patient for a specific reason or um, in some cases appealing to their to their insurance if, if, if you know there is any coverage at all for services like acupuncture um, some insurances will um, be more receptive to that I think joint symptoms in general you know we know that it's very common as, as many as 40 percent of patients can experience some kind of joint aches and pains from these uh, of the aromatase inhibitor class of medications in particular and there have been um, lately some drugs that have been shown to be beneficial in managing this, um, which um, duloxetine is one of them. Um, and this was kind of in the last year or two has been being recognized as a, uh, as a very um, effective drug, um, uh, drug-based therapy for patients with joint aches and pains. Um, I think that it certainly, I think what we try to do first is just in some patients' time um, is what helps the most, um, and we, you know, it, it can some of these symptoms can alleviate over time. And some patients, we do need to introduce these other medications, um, and in some patients, we need to switch, you know, switch drugs within the same class of aromatase inhibitors um, to see if that may potentially provide some better results. And in some patients, we need to switch, you know, to an entirely different class like tamoxifen. 
Um, I think just what to stress is really, you know, these therapies work. Um, they will, they only work if if we can um, have our patients take them regularly. So I think adherence again is such an issue um, that you know even if um, even if you know for instance tamoxifen may be slightly less effective than aromatase inhibitors in the setting of um, of early stage or, or you know or curable breast cancer in the adjuvant setting. Um, if they t if patients are more likely to adhere to this alternate agent than an aromatase inhibitor, it's completely appropriate to change therapy to tamoxifen or something else. So um, I think that, you know, again, just for side effect management for AIs, I think the biggest thing that we endorse is supportive care. Exercise has been shown to help. There's some other drug therapies that are beneficial, um, like duloxetine. Um, and acupuncture, if, and certainly the challenge with that, as, as, as this person had mentioned, is, is how to how to pay for it, and insurance doesn't always cover it. Thank you. So you, uh, you talked a lot about adherence, and adherence is cited, of course, as a possible cause of worse outcomes for some patients. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how you work with patients to ensure adequate adherence? Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that I think just that very candid discussion about adherence right off the bat at the beginning is important to have, um, and this open communication where you know if if a patient is struggling um, with medication, they're able to um, call us and reach us in the clinic, talk to our nurses. Um, talk to talk to us about issues that they're having sooner rather than later. So, um, not suffering in silence, but certainly being very vocal about side effects so that we can address them sooner rather than later. So, I find in patients where adherence is more of an issue, is where that you know that initial conversation really wasn't um, maybe wasn't as as salient or as impactful. Um, where you know patients really do need to understand why are they even doing this. Of what what benefits are they providing? Is it providing them, um, and the outcomes are worse if they are non-adherent? And knowing that oftentimes behind adherence is it's not, and in the older in the older patients, it, it may be other things other than side effects. So some of the studies, and I didn't include all of this data, do show that it's not necessarily side effects. It's not necessarily that they're having more symptoms um, that's leading to non-adherence. It might be something else. Again, it might be that um, you know their functional capacity isn't that great. So as one of our ADLs, uh, the independent activity of daily living that I mentioned, it's the ability to take their own medication. So let's say patients don't have the ability, you know, to get to the pharmacy, um, you know, or get their refills or, um, you know, and that, and that can be in certain, you know, obviously in specific cases, that that's not always the case. But I think it's just acknowledging that um, adherence is a complicated um, complicated issue, and there can be many reasons for non-adherence other than just side effects. So looking even straight off the bat, the minute the patient tells you at their three-month follow-up, I'm not taking my medications as prescribed, really kind of asking why and what the challenges are um, and trying to come up with solutions. And I think in our in our clinic, I've noticed that our nurses are, are wonderful and they can be very, um, very impactful in, in helping us work with patients to, you know, you know help them for instance, pill diaries or pill boxes or um, kind of trying to troubleshoot with them in between their every three to four month visits to do some symptom, symptom and side effect management. So I, I think it ultimately, it comes down to just very frank communication and, um, you know, maintaining close follow-up. So with my patients especially that I find that are struggling and with these medications, bringing them in more regularly to kind of to kind of troubleshoot and see, um, you know, if we can come up with a better solution. Thank you. Um, so, here's a question for you: how How is the system to serve patients with breast cancer? changing as the portion of the population gets older and older. I'm sorry, one more time. 
<laughs> so, so you, you talked about how the, the population is growing older, right? The uh -huh. baby boomers are getting older, and by the year 2030, 2050, uh, percent, you know, a large percentage of the population will be over a certain age. So how is the healthcare system changing, you think? How is the healthcare system Absolutely. changing? I see. Yeah. I think this is... You know, I don't, I don't know that it, um, that it has changed much, and I think that's kind of all up in the air with all um, certainly a little bit unpredictable. Um, I think that, um, I think it's it certainly, I think it'll come down to how Medicare steps up. Um, in my, in my just, just my personal opinion, um, you know, I think providing um, certain ancillary services, you know, um, you know, like whether it's more home care or um, kind of just supporting, you know, supporting, supporting services that help with issues like adherence or transportation or other, other issues. I think it's just essentially I think it's going to be recognizing what the issues are in older adults and um, the barriers to care and kind of setting up more of an infrastructure to help with that. You know, I think geriatricians, for instance, so I, I mentioned geriatricians, and geriatricians are, are internal medicine doctors that specialize in the care of older adults, and, and there's actually not a lot of them. There's a shortage nationwide, and, and they provide wonderful services. I mean, they do these, they perform these geriatric assessments on patients that can take upwards of, you know, 30 minutes. Um, or longer, and that's just the assessment itself. So, you know, it even there's even policy issues going down to like how is that being compensated, and and do our providers have enough time to to give to patients in the clinic to perform these assessments so that we can do the right, um, make the right intervention. So I think this is a it's a it's a very complicated issue, and I think um, you know there's not there's not great solutions, um, but I think. That I think we definitely need more geriatricians. We need more um, providers that are familiar with issues in older adults. We need more oncologists that are are willing to do um, provide the care and do the research to figure out you know what how should we treat our older patients. Um, and then we need Medicare to help us as well and 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 provide these more supportive services that allow us to deliver that care um, in the real world. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, someone's asking about age bias on the other end of the spectrum in young women. Mm -hmm. So our our helpline and our support groups, you know, are often flooded with stories from young women who are refused mammograms, even though they're presenting with a lump in their breast because of their age, because they're they're too young. Mm -hmm. I know it's not your area of expertise, but can you comment at all? I think that um, you know there's a lot of controversy um, surrounding mammography, and and um, even amongst the younger patients, I know that there's been a lot of um, it's, a, it's a very controversial area. Um, I'll say that um, I think that the importance, and I think this will become more of an issue in the upcoming years, is um, is really with younger women, we worry more about genetics and there being some kind of genetic predisposition to developing cancer. And I think that, um, I think there's some, there's definitely a lot of work being done as to how should we liberalize genetic testing? Um, you know, are these the are patients that, you know, are, are oftentimes have some kind of genetic associated genetically predisposed best breast cancer have these very kind of you know colorful family histories of breast cancer and probably should be tested earlier or screened earlier so I think that this is kind of an evolving area um, and this is kind of a whole another discussion on policy in and of itself as you know who exactly should be how much should we liberalize genetic testing in younger patients at risk for breast cancer so I think that I we do acknowledge that there are some difficulties, and, and we know that the biology of younger breast cancer patients is starkly different um, than, you know, the average patient with breast cancer or the older patient, where it tends to be more aggressive, and, and we have less time to lose, you know, at the in, you know at the initial presentation to when they're initially diagnosed. The disease can develop very quickly. So, I, I'm hopeful that you know some 
recommendations will be better laid out in terms of genetic counseling and genetic testing um, that may inform some of these um, screening um, recommendations a little bit better. Um, and I think till we have that, we just, you know, we're kind of it's a little frustrating and we're a little stuck. But um, the recommendation definitely, I mean, if, if, if yes, if, if someone feels, if, if a patient, if it comes to their attention just to get medical care immediately and um, if there is a diagnostic need for a breast ultrasound or mammogram, it's, it's certainly almost, I've never seen, in my own experience, seen a circumstance where it's not, you know, covered or, or it's not, not appropriately covered by insurance. Right, and we hope that that's the case. We do continue to get calls about, you know, women who presented with, you know, something suspicious in the breast who, who are told to just kind of wait and watch and then, um, you know, have them presented with stage four metastatic disease. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we hear that story more often than not. So we just can worry. We're just trying to get your thoughts about, you um, you know, the biases that, that occur in the medical right. field in the opposite direction, you know, for younger women. So Exactly. And I think, I think my general recommendation, I think that, and I think that's where, um, where we can all be better advocates for patients and encourage that, you know, if, if there is something that's persistent, you know, for even more than a couple weeks or um, is causing any amount of concern, imaging is never... A bad idea, um, and it can always be justified. Um, in most cases, can always be justified. Um, and I think it, you know, I think, I think we just need to get that message out to our patients. And and you know, there's not, you know, this needs to be done obviously under the care of under the appropriate guidance of a, a, a primary care provider. But I think we all are our own advocates, and I, I do, I do think that's important for our patients to know um, that. It's never, it's never, it never hurts to get that test um, if it's a concern, um, if it's a valid concern, and it usually always is. So I just want to encourage the audience to, you know, we're going to be wrapping up in a few minutes, your last chance to get your questions answered. And uh, in the meantime, another question. You talked about the geriatric assessments to help healthcare providers make proper treatment decisions for older women. Are these widely implemented, the assessment tools, are they widely implemented? That is a, that's a great question, and, um, and, and the, the point that I'll make is um, from this presentation in reference to that is, is it's not, unfortunately. And I think it's, it's again, I think it's um, partly in how everything is structured in the outpatient setting and our time constraints in practice. but. I do think that the geriatric, even though it's encouraged to do on, on everyone over the age of 65, right, which is a large population of patients, it's, it's, it's underutilized. And I think that's mostly because um, oncologists aren't trained in how to do this. This is something that geri geriatricians, so um, physicians for older patients, routinely do in their practice, but, um, but oncologists aren't trained to do this, nor do they necessarily have the time resource to do that. So I think this is where that multidisciplinary team effort is um, is so important, um, you know. And and I think there are um, there are shorter assessments that, and I didn't go into this so much, but there are shorter screening tests or shorter versions of the geriatric assessment that, if a patient kind of um, scores very abnormally, and these assessments tend to be screening tests, I should say. Um, as opposed to the formal assessment, tend to take, you know, only a couple minutes, where a physician can then say, you know, there are some concerns in the screening test that um, I think this patient needs a full geriatric assessment, and I will, you know, take that extra step to make sure that they see a geriatrician. So it's, it's uh, I'll be honest, I think that a lot of oncologists aren't um, quite aware of the important role that a geriatric assessment plays. Um, don't have the time resource or the knowledge to do it, um, but I think that's why, um, you know, partner, partnering with our colleagues in geriatrics is so important because, you know, for the patients that do need it who would benefit, we can make sure that it happens. Um, 
I think about, you know, I've just been thinking about a case that I saw in clinic of a patient that um, clearly had some early signs of dementia. And so had, you know, had I not kind of, you know, had we not kind of pursued that part of that geriatric assessment and really kind of asked questions and tested her cognitive function, would we have known that she really wasn't, kind of her ability to make decisions was a little bit borderline because of this, you know, cognitive dysfunction or mild dementia that she was having. So I think that, um, you know, I think this is part of part of modern day medicine where we just never, none of us has enough time to really, um, you know, kind of have these very important conversations and um, evaluations in clinic. But it is, it is really important, and I think when it can't be done by oncology, um, by the oncologist, um, which is which is the truth and, and reality in many cases, we do need to partner with our um, with our colleagues to make sure that it does happen at some point early on. So I think we have one one last question here, unless anyone else in the audience would like to submit your question now. Um, you talked about this a little bit, but we'll ask again. So how can an elder breast cancer patient advocate for themselves to get the appropriate treatment that's based on their overall health and not just on their chronological age? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So I think, generally speaking, um, I think the, you know, the early buy-in or you know, evaluations and more of a multidisciplinary approach where there is that opportunity for the internist or the, you know, the geriatric specialist to weigh in on how the patient's general health is and what their life expectancy is and how they're doing otherwise, aside from the breast cancer, um, is helpful for, for the oncologist to know kind of going forward and making treatment recommendations. And I think understanding what, you know, kind of standard, you know, it always is never, you know, just simply asking, like, what is, you know, what is standard treatment for someone with my condition? So that is a very, I think that's a very powerful question um, that one can always ask their oncologist. And um, just being very forthright and, and, and what, you know, what are treatment recommendations that you are making to me and how are, how do those differ and why do those differ? So I think it's even understanding, I think there is some physician bias and I, I, I do think that is, um, that exists everywhere in, in, in certainly in the setting. Um, but I think just asking those very pointed questions um, and really identifying whether that recommendation is differing and why it's differing I think is, is something that, you know, the patient, the patient can do. Um, and and I think that's you know I think that's the main thing and then just of course as I mentioned getting kind of you know the the con consultative expertise of these other um, these other you know other other people um, such as geriatricians that can weigh in on you know a patient's overall health and their their um, you know their general health and how they will do with treatment and concerns that they may have is also helpful. Yeah, thank you for that. And also, you know, the advocacy organizations like SHARE um, help women prepare for doctor visits. We have lots of trained volunteers who breast cancer survivors are living with advanced disease who can you know, help a patient prepare for a visit with their doctor. So there's always that resource okay. as well. So I think I think that was our last question from the audience. So thank you so much, Dr. Caratori. We really appreciate it. If uh, thank you. If uh, anyone in the audience has any additional questions, feel free to call our helpline at eight four four ask share. Thanks again for a great program. And to the audience, if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment to fill out a survey, it will pop up when we end the webinar. And that helps us in um, providing additional programming for you. Thank you all for participating. We appreciate it. Dr. Caratori, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.